So I'd like to welcome everyone to Denver Dale Amateur Radio Club uh, and uh, a big welcome to visitors to the club tonight that have come either because uh, you've uh, made links with us. So we've got links now with various radio clubs around the UK. Uh, and of course, uh, we've had people that have become uh, regular visitors to the Denby Dale online meetings. You are welcome every week at our meetings. Um, our speaker tonight is Carl, uh, K9LA. And uh, he wrote, for those of you that uh, don't see the ARRL magazine published in the States, uh, by uh, called QST. Uh, Carl um, uh, wrote a very interesting piece in QST on Solar Cycle 25. And I'm not going to do anything at all to uh, steal Carl's, uh, <laughs> Carl's talk tonight, other than to say, as someone uh, who has been a radio amateur for a long time, and for people in this room who haven't been radio amateurs for a long time, and therefore have not witnessed a, a very, very good uh, HF propagation when we're at the, the peak of a good solar cycle. Uh, have some patience because you will find it just amazing. And for those of you that are new license holders uh, into HF, uh, who've listened on 10 meters and occasionally hear something, but most of the time hear nothing, uh, when you want to make uh, single sideband contacts into uh, the west coast of the US, uh, into Alaska, into uh, Hawaii, uh, 10 meters when it's open will give you that with 100 watts with a piece of wire in your back garden. So, uh, Carl, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, welcome you tonight. I, and I read, uh, Carl, that you got your novice license in 1961, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's right, Nick. Uh, looks like there are two in the waiting room, too. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep, we'll, we'll look after it, Carl. Don't worry, okay. we'll just let them in, so. Okay, good enough. Well, thank you, Nick, for the introduction and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I know there's some good mornings, there's some good afternoons, and maybe good late evenings, even. I'm Carl K9LA. I uh, live in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, up in the northeast corner of the state, real close to Michigan and Ohio. So uh, let me share my screen here. I'm going to turn off my video. Let's see here. Okay. Share. Okay, Nick, let me know if when it comes up, hopefully. Yeah, that's come up. Yeah, we can see the... Um, okay, let me go to full program. screen now. I hope. Yeah, there we go. Brilliant. Okay, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is cycle 25 and also uh, talk about some propagation that you can expect, not only right now, but uh, as cycle 25 goes up. So here's a little bit more about me. As Nick said, I got my novice and uh, my US novice license in October 61. So it's been a while. I've been through several solar cycles. Uh, I went to Purdue University, um, an electrical engineer, and I was an RF design engineer by profession. Um, mostly I did solid state RF power amplifiers and I retired in late 2013 and I'm enjoying it, let me tell you. I enjoy uh, propagation, trying to figure it out. I uh, enjoy DXing, contesting, and tennis, and also vintage equipment. There's in the upper right, there's my uh, novice station, a national NC60 and a Heathkit DX35. Uh, the national NC60 is uh, one of the typical uh, five tube all American, uh, what's called the all American designs didn't have an RF stage, so it was a struggle on 15, the 15 meter novice band, not being able to hear too much. The X35 uh, put out about, oh, maybe 30, 35 watts. And uh, of course, not knowing anything back then, it didn't matter. I had a lot of fun. 
I'm also an associate member of the uh, RSGB's Propagation Studies Committee, uh, the chairman's Steve, G0KYA. And uh, here's a shameless plug, uh, check out his book, Radio Propagation Explained. I'm sure you can buy it off of the uh, RSGB bookstore or whatever it's called. My wife is Vicki, AE9YL. It's very helpful to have your wife be in a ham. <laughs> um, and there's a picture of her on a camel when we were on the de-expedition to Syria back in February 2001, Yankee Kilo 9 Alpha. Hopefully I worked uh, many of you uh, who were on the air back then. Um, we had a really great experience uh, there. I'm also currently the ARRL Central Division Vice Director, Central Division being Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. The Vice Director means if the director ever falls over, I take, I'll take over. Okay, here's what we'll talk about. We'll, we'll look at uh, all 24 cycles very quickly because it gives a good picture of where we are. Uh, I'll review the cycle 24 predictions and then review the cycle 25 predictions, dig into detail of uh, two of them. I'll even uh, work through our prediction for cycle 25. We'll see how that comes out when uh, cycle 25 peaks. Talk a little bit about what you can expect for HF propagation now and how fast is cycle 25 rising because that may give us a clue on how big it's gonna be. And then take a broader look at propagation as cycle 25 rises. So here's a picture of all solar cycles, all 24 of them. Uh, the vertical axis is the maximum smooth sunspot number of each cycle. And of course there are 24 of them. You can see there's a little red annotation about what is V1. We'll get to that in a, a couple slides later. As you can see, we've recorded three periods of big solar cycles, and we've recorded two periods of small solar cycles, that being what's called the Dalton minimum, cycles five, six, and seven, and also the Gleisberg minimum, cycles 12 through 16, 17. So we appear to be in the third period of small solar cycles, and the big question is, uh, will cycle 25 get us out of this period? or will it keep us in this period uh, for another small solar cycle? All I can say is we're gonna have to wait and see what happens. And uh, you'll see uh, a little bit more about that later. Okay, cycle 24 predictions. There were 57, at least uh, what I'm aware of. And that came from uh, uh, Dr. Pesnell of NASA, uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center. Back in 2008, uh, 57 predictions. They range from a low of 40 up to a high of 185. And here's a breakdown in the lower right corner of the method and how many in each method and what the range was. Let me get rid of this. Uh, see if I can do that. No, I can't. Shoot. Oh, I can minimize it though. Yeah, there we go. Well, you can see most of the uh, predictions were the precursor method. In other words, something before cycle 25, 24 started told us what cycle 24 may be. Unfortunately, the range was 70 to 180, so it's not a very precise method. Uh, many ways to do it. So what did cycle actually, 24 actually do? Well, it hit a maximum of 81 in the second peak. The first peak was a little bit lower in uh, uh, early 2012, the second peak in about mid-2014. Now, several predictions were correct, but were they correct for the right reason? You know, I'll have a comment on that a little bit later. Five of the six methods had a very big range of predictions, as you saw in that previous chart. Uh, the, the two neural network predictions had the same prediction, but they missed by quite a bit. They predicted a maximum of 142, but the actual was about 81. So uh, some people did okay, most people didn't. 
One question you might ask is why were there two peaks for cycle 24? Well, we've seen it before. You can see uh, in the, the peak around 1990, um, that was uh, tw cycle 22. 23 also had two peaks. And the second peak of cycle 23 gave us excellent 10 meter and six meter F2 propagation. And there's cycle 24. It really had an exaggerated second peak. The two peaks are due to the fact that the two solar hemispheres aren't working together. In other words, one hemisphere dominates with sunspots and then they go away. And then the next, the other hemisphere dominates. Uh, we don't understand this. So I'm not sure we can predict if cycle 25 is gonna have one or two peaks with any confidence. So why are there so many predictions? Well. We just don't under, fully understand the details of what generates the length and amplitude of a solar cycle. You know, we know it has to do with how plasma flows inside the sun and how the magnetic fields move inside the sun, but we're not real sure what drives these flows and movements. Now, we also have to maybe take into account the gravitational force of Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, force is uh, the mass of one times the mass of other over R squared. So those three planets really do have a gravitational force upon the sun. What about the movement of the sun about the center of mass of the solar system? That changes. And what about the wobble of the sun about its rotational axis? There's some indication that all of those could have uh, could, could uh, have something to do with uh, the fact that our solar cycle is 11 years. Uh, so we'll have to uh, look at that later, I guess. So I mentioned the V1. What does V1 mean? Well, beginning in 2011, there were four sunspot or solar workshops held, and their purpose was to review the old sunspot data because there was some concern that there were some problems with it. So after the four workshops, there were changes that were deemed necessary to have a more accurate record of sunspot history. The Royal Observatory of Belgium began reporting the new sunspot numbers on July 1st, 2015. Now there on the right is a plot of the old sunspot numbers versus the new sunspot numbers for cycles 19 through 24. And you can see the new sunspot numbers are much higher. And what that says is uh, we think we have a more accurate record now of what happened over the last 24 solar cycles. And uh, th this correction went all the way back to 1755 when cycle one started. Again, the old sunspot data is V1, the new sunspot data is V2. Uh, when we're at solar minimum, it really doesn't matter which version of the record you use because, you know, uh, zero sunspots is zero sunspots, no matter if it's V1 or V2. Now, the, the biggest issue was, was the transition from Rudolf Wolf to Alfred Wolfer uh, a long time ago. Alfred Wolfer counted sunspots. And he counted more sunspots than Rudolf Wolf. So what he did is applied a value of 0.6 to his numbers to make them agree with Rudolf Wolf's number. That 0.6 got carried through all the way to the present time. And that's one of the big issues that the four uh, workshops kind of said, hey, it's really not what we should be doing anymore. So that was taken out along with some other minor, minor issues. And again, it all comes about because uh, humans are involved in counting sunspots. You know, how, how, how good is your telescope? What do you think is a, a sunspot? Now, one of the uh, issues with the new sunspot record is that our, our propagation prediction programs were developed based on the old sunspot numbers. So if you plug in a new sunspot number, the prediction is going to come out somewhat optimistic. And around solar maximum, when the difference in the two records is most, uh, the difference is about one band. So for example, if you uh, take these sunspot numbers that are reported now, 
and plug them into our propagation program. And you say it says that uh, 12 meters is open. Well, it may just be the 15. So I got to be careful with that. And of course, two sunspot numbers now that can make things quite confusing. Also, what's what's this talk about monthly mean sunspot number and smooth sunspot numbers? There's a plot of solar cycle 24 in terms of the monthly mean sunspot number in blue and the smooth sunspot number in red. Now the monthly mean is uh, the monthly average. You just count all the sunspots for every day and divide it by the number of days in a month and that's your monthly mean, monthly average. You can see it's rather spiky. If you even looked at the daily sunspot num numbers, which is not shown, which are not shown, it's even more spiky than the monthly mean data. Um, so the next step was to uh, further average the monthly means. In other words, we're averaging the averages. <laughs> and that's what the smooth data does. And you can see that it's a much better uh, visual picture of what the cycle did. It's quite obvious that cycle 24 had two peaks, whereas in the monthly means, you kind of got the hint, but you might wonder about it. Now, because the smooth data is uh, a further average of the monthly mean data, that means the smooth data is six months behind the monthly means. And that can be confusing too. Now here's a picture of the transition from cycle 24 to cycle 25. It's kind of kind of busy, <laughs> but um, the red vertical bars are cycle 24 monthly means. The blue vertical bars are cycle 25 monthly means. And what stands out is the fact that uh, solar cycles overlap. There was a period of about a year where we saw both cycle 24 sunspots and cycle 25 sunspots. That also occurred uh, uh, in the transition from cycle 23 to 24 and probably did even before that. Now, it's interesting that uh, the first official cycle 25 sunspot occurred in July 2019, and the last cycle 24 sunspot occurred in July 2020. So that's about a year overlap. The transition between cycles 23 and 24 had about a one year, three month overlap. And this brings up the question, when does a solar cycle really start and really end? You've probably read about uh, uh, December 2019 being declared as solar minimum. And I've even seen some uh, writings that say uh, that's when solar cycle 24 ended and cycle 25 started. But that's not really true because that first cycle 25 sunspot was in July of 2019, you know, six months before uh, December 2019. So that brings up that question, when does a solar cycle really start and end? Um, interestingly, uh, even in November 2018, there was a cycle 25 sunspot, but it was of such short duration and it was so small that it did not get assigned an active region number. So it wasn't counted as a cycle 25 sunspot. So we, we've got some, uh, interesting things to think about in sunspot cycles. Now, you may want, you may ask, how, how do we know it's a cycle 24 sunspot? How, how do we know it's a cycle 25 sunspot? Well, we can tell two ways, where it emerges on the solar disk. Uh, when a new cycle starts, the sunspots emerge at the higher solar latitudes. And as the sunspot cycle progresses, they emerge closer and closer to the equator. So that's a telltale sign. The other way is the polarity of the magnetic field loop. Loop, You know, a sunspot is uh, just a magnetic field coming out of the sun and going back in. And we can tell uh, what, uh, what the polarity of that is, which, which side goes out, comes out, and which side goes in. So that's really a pretty decent way of telling uh, what's, what cycle a sunspot is coming from. Okay, cycle 25 predictions. Well, we haven't done much better. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Dr. Bezecker of NOAA uh, shows a picture of uh, 53 
cycle 25 prediction. So we still <laughs> have lots of people predicting sunspot cycles based on different methods. Again, the range is very high from 40 to about 230. Uh, and there's a breakdown of the methodology. There's uh, similar methodologies. I think the ones that's eventually going to uh, come out on top is is the uh, solar dynamo, how things flow inside the sun, you know, a good physics model. Here's a distribution of those 53 predictions. Now there are three more that came out after uh, that chart by uh, the NOAA guy. So there are a total of 56. The horizontal axis is the uh, sunspot number bucket. For example, there's one prediction uh, of uh, maximum smooth sunspot number between 25 and 49. The highest number of predictions fall in the bucket of a smooth sunspot number between 100 and 124. There's 15 of those. And we can summarize by saying that uh, 50 of the 56 predictions, that's 89%, are for a below average cycle. You can see where an average cycle falls at about 179. So it falls in the 175 to 199 bucket. Three are above average, or three are average, and you can see that. And there are three above average. Now, more than likely, there's some more predictions out there, and uh, I will keep this chart updated as, as I find out about them. So here's uh, one of the low predictions. It's by the Solar Cycle 25 prediction panel uh, within NOAA and NASA. They predict a maximum of 115 in mid-2025. It's about the same as Cycle 24, which is on the left. Their prediction is in red. Will Cycle 25 have one or two peaks? Yeah, I'm guessing it's going to have two peaks, but we'll have to wait and see. I'll let you know in about 2025 or 2026. There's the URL if you want to go look at that prediction every month. And I will be sending a, uh, uh, a copy of this presentation to Nick, and he can do whatever he wants with it. Put it on your website or whatever. Now, let's take a look at one of the big predictions. It's by Dr. Scott McIntosh and others. It has received much publicity because it's significantly bigger than most predictions. Of course, if their prediction comes true, that's going to be great for 10 meters and 6 meters. Well, even greater, <laughs> even greater for 10 meters and 6 meters. And what it is, it's based on the time difference of termination dates of the inferred magnetic activity band. So he's, they're trying to get inside the sun to see how the magnetic fields are moving around. And the chart on the right shows the terminate, termination date of each solar cycle uh, when they think it really ended. And the last column is the delta between uh, the uh, existing or, or the, uh, the one in the row and the one before it. So what they did is uh, they plotted the time and years between termination dates versus the maximum of the next solar cycle. And you can see what happened. Those are the green dots. There's a linear trend line. It's pretty decent correlation. R is 0.79. Not bad. And um, what they estimated the cycle 24 termination date to be was uh, early 2020. And they had the cycle 25, 23 termination date of 20, early 2011. So the difference in those two dates is 9.29 years. So if you go on the horizontal axis, find 9.29 and go up to the red dashed line, you can see that uh, that gives a prediction of about 229. So that's where their prediction came from. Now, unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, the cycle 25 termination date has not yet occurred. Uh, Dr. McIntosh has not confirmed it yet. So it's about a year after their initial estimate. 
So if we go to 10.29, we'll see that the prediction would be for 200. That wouldn't be bad. It's still above average. But again, it's going to totally depend on when the 25, cycle 25 termination date really occurs. If it goes out another six months, then uh, cycle 25 would be predicted to be average. If it goes farther than that, it's going to get smaller. All we can do is sit and wait and see what happens. Now let's take a look, look at uh, recent solar minimums. This is pretty interesting. Uh, there's a group of five on the left in the chart. Those are the solar minimum periods between cycles 18 and 19, 19 and 20, 20, 21, 21, 22, 22, and 23. And you can see if you've been a ham during those years, we've experienced very small or very short duration solar minimum periods, only about two years. That was a small price to pay for having some really big cycles. So the green is the duration of the minimum between cycle 23 and 24. It was about 56 months. Now, my definition of solar minimum was when the smooth sunspot number was below 20. I looked at different values, 15, 25, and the, the, the same trend occurs. Now, the duration of uh, the solar minimum between cycles 24 and 25 is the thick red line. And right now it's at 49 months and continuing. Uh, it looks like it may end up around 60 months or even more. Oh boy. So what does that mean? Well, this is the basis for the prediction we're going to make here as a team. Here's a plot of how long you've been at solar minimum versus what, how big the next solar cycle is. And you can see uh, the, 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 the correlation is about 0.763, so it's pretty decent. And what this says is, uh, this plot is similar to the Macintosh plot. Something longer suggests a smaller next cycle. Now, this one specifically says the longer we're at solar minimum, the smaller the next cycle. So if uh, cycle 25, or the minimum between 24 and 25 comes out at 60 months, you can see it's going to be a pretty small solar cycle. It'll be interesting to see how this compares with uh, when the cycle 25 termination date is confirmed and you enter that on the chart on the previous plot. Okay, so what's HF propagation like right now? Well, we're kind of still near solar minimum. Now, uh, the low band should be better than they are. Uh, I think a lot of people are puzzled by this and uh, it seems like there's something going on with 160 and 80 and 40 that we don't fully understand. Uh, are coronal holes causing geomagnetic disturbances which screws up the lower bands? Or are galactic cosmic rays causing more ionospheric absorption? Uh, those two could be an answer, but it's tough proving it. <laughs> uh, the good news is there's even if we have zero sunspots and the solar 10.7 centimeter solar fluxes around 65 to 70, there's still enough extreme ultraviolet for 20 meters to be open worldwide during the day and early evening. That also applies to 17, but to a little bit lesser degree. The higher bands, 15, 12, and 10 are spotty. If you're going to have openings, uh, they're mostly going to be north-south openings. That's because as you go farther south, there's more ionization until you get to the equatorial ionosphere, which is the most robust portion of the whole ionosphere in the world. Of course, you should not forget sporadic E on 6 and 10 in the summer months. That appears to uh, occur regardless of where you are in a solar cycle. And of course, don't forget the digital modes because they offer an advantage a signal to noise ratio advantage over sideband and also CW. Um, I've made the statement before and I'll make it here that this solar minimum will probably go down in history as the most active on the higher bands because of the digital modes. 
Okay, now some comments on that last slide. Uh, although I said we're at solar minimum, the sun can hiccup. And it did that late last year. We had some great propagation on the higher HF bands for CQ Worldwide DX contest and the ARRL 10 meter contest. The cause was a big spike in uh, extreme ultraviolet. That's the, uh, the green plot there on the right. Uh, I've also put the 10.7 centimeter solar flux on there. Uh, the solar flux is a proxy, just like sunspots are a proxy for the extreme ultraviolet for the F2 region. You can see they're kind of kind of pretty good, pretty well cor correlated. Unfortunately, it looks like we're kind of back to solar minimum now. Oh well. The, the takeaway from this is if you see a big spike in the 10.7 centimeter solar flux, head to the higher HF bands. Things could be uh, 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 much better for a short period of time. So how fast is cycle 25 rising? Well, why do we care? Well, here's a plot of how long it took a cycle to rise to its maximum versus how big it was. You can see that uh, uh, the general trend is the longer a solar cycle takes to rise means the smaller cycle it's going to be. The correlation again is in that decent area, 0.7784. Uh, a correlation of uh, R of one means it's perfectly correlated and all the data would be, would fall right on that trend line. An R value of zero means there's no correlation and the data would be scattered all about that dash trend line. So what it says, like I said, um, big cycles tend to rise faster than small cycles. So how fast is cycle 25 rising? Well, we have nine months of cycle 25 data. That's the smooth data. And what I did is uh, plotted it with solar minimum at the same point on the horizontal axis. Now, I also plotted cycle 24, which is the smallest in our lifetime. Not in all history though. And also plotted cycle 19, which is the biggest in our lifetime. And it's the biggest in our recorded history. More than likely, there were even bigger cycles way, way back in time. So you can see that, uh, that uh, cycle 19 didn't go as low as the other two cycles. It just says that uh, cycle, uh, the min between uh, 23 and 24 and 24 and 25 have been very deep solar minimums. Now let's add some straight lines to that data. So what I did is uh, just, for example, for uh, solar, uh, for cycle 19 from the minimum up to the nine month point. You can see that the, uh, what the slope is, if we assume it's a, uh, a linear line, and also did that for, for the cycle 24 and cycle 19. Uh, cycle 24, you can see it's there in the red dashed line and cycle 25 is the red dashed green line. And what we see is, Cycle 25 is not rising as fast as cycle 19 yet, and maybe it never will. It's rising a little bit faster than cycle 24. Uh, but solar cycles don't rise in a straight line. So I think we need some more data to see what's going to really happen to cycle 25. Hopefully in six to 12 months, we'll have a very decent clue as to where cycle 25 is going. Will it continue to rise kind of slowly or will it speed up and uh, take off? Okay, so what's propagation gonna be like on HF as cycle 25 rises? And what we're talking about is when the bands are gonna be consistently good. Like we talked about 10 meters before, the, before my presentation. And uh, uh, these are um, estimates when 10 meters is going to be good on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day it's going to be good. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, this is the uh, solar cycle 25 prediction panels prediction, similar to 24. And if it is 
cycle 25 is si similar to cycle 24. Uh, 160 meters should be kind of good now until 2022 or so when the coronal mass ejections and flares start up. We'll talk about disturbances here in a, in a couple of slides. 10 meters should be good from 2023 to 2027. So uh, to have 10 meters back consistently, we still have several years to go. But always remember, if the solar flux or the sunspot number spikes up significantly, get on the higher bands because things might be good for, uh, for a bit. And then again, 160 meters will be back uh, when uh, coronal holes come to an end on the declining portion of the solar cycle. That may be after 2030, 2031. Uh, but, you know, there, there's just a general uh, uh, feeling that 160 meters is best at solar minimum, but you can still work lots of stuff at solar maximum, but more people kind of head towards 10 meters where the uh, 15 and 12 and 10, where the signals are well above the noise and not at the noise level. Now, if cycle 25 rises significantly faster than cycle uh, 24, then the higher bands are going to be back a little bit earlier. And we'll have uh, probably another year or two of 10 meter, great 10 meter openings. We'll just have to wait and see. <clears throat> now, here's a way to determine what's going on in the bands right now. There's the URL, prop.kc2g.com. What he does is uh, takes ionosan data and uh, adds contour lines of the worldwide maximum usable frequency for a 3000 kilometer hop. This was for 1030 Zulu this morning. And it shows that uh, over Europe, uh, the MUF for a 3000 kilometer hop is mm, almost around 20 megahertz. Of course, over in uh, North America, it's still dark. You can see the gray line there. So the MUFs are gonna be lower. This is updated every 15 minutes. So this will give you a decent picture of what you could expect worldwide. Now, there's another way to do it too. Uh, you could go to DX Maps. And what I'm showing here is, uh, <clears throat> this is a map of Europe on the left. It's the, uh, from 0943 to 1043 Zulu today on 17 meters. And you can see there was a lot of 17 meter activity. Um, you can pick a worldwide view. You can pick any of the bands. You can see the bands, uh, 200, you know, who's, who's working who on 2200 meters, 630 meters, 160, all the way up through uh, VHF. You can select VHF also when, uh, you know, in the summer during sporadic, you can look at six meters and how it's doing. Now, DX Maps isn't the only way to do this. The PSK Reporter, WhisperNet, even the Reverse Beacon Network would allow you to. Uh, uh, see what's going on right now. Who's working who? And again, it's a, another great way to determine what uh, what's going on right now. Okay, disturbances to propagation. Uh, generally, we uh, got to mention those because uh, uh, they can screw things up. There are three categories. Uh, there are geomagnetic storms. Uh, they're due to coronal mass ejections and a coronal holes. Coronal holes seem to be worse. Both can cause elevated K and N, A indices and that adversely impacts the F2 region. Now CMEs, uh, coronal mass ejections occur most often around solar maximum. Coronal holes occur on the declining phase of the solar cycle. Solar radiation storms are Particles from big solar flares causing increased absorption in the polar cap. Big solar flares tend to occur around solar maximum. And there are radio blackouts when X-ray radiation uh, from big solar flares causes increased absorption on the daylight side of the Earth. And again, uh, those three disturbances kind of go in order of uh, most severe to least severe. So geomagnetic storms can last for several days <laughs> or even longer. And that little plot of a solar cycle also shows uh, that uh, the rising portion of a solar cycle tends to be the quietest 
time. So uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, enough sunspots and, a, and, and not many uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares and we can uh, initially have some great propagation as cycle 25 rises. Uh, there's just a note there that the average rise time of a solar cycle is about four years, average declines about seven. That's where the 11 years comes from approximately. So which prediction is going to be most accurate? Well, the guy, the little, the guy over there is shrugging his shoulder and says, who knows? Uh, someone's going to be correct. There's no doubt about it. It's going to be interesting to see if who is correct for cycle 24 will be correct for cycle 25. Maybe they're onto something. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Now it's unfortunate that solar cycles are so long. That, that means it takes a heck of a long time to ascertain whether a prediction is right or wrong. I mean, even if you make a prediction at solar minimum, it may take four years to validate it. So uh, this is just a long process and the scientific method can be frustrating at times. So summary, we don't fully understand solar cycles. That's why we have so many predictions. Uh, right now, the low bands in 20 and 17 eh, should be pretty good. 15, 12, and 10 should be spotty. Uh, should get better as cycle 25 rises. Again, don't forget sporadic E in the summer for six meters. And I expect that even if cycle 25 is like cycle 24, we'll have some good F2 propagation around solar maximum of cycle 25. Again, use the digital modes with their signal to noise ratio advantage. At least you'll uh, stay active instead of listening to noise. <laughs> and that's a picture of my little homebrew uh, QRP, 250 milliwatts, 10 meter transceiver. It wants to see a big cycle. So uh, there's a part of me that says, let's have a real big cycle, but eh, I'm kind of, if I was a bet man, I'd bet on a smaller cycle. So Nick, that's all I had. If there are any questions, I, I did see someone raise their hand before, but uh, that's okay. We can uh, go back and answer a question if it's on a particular slide. Brilliant, lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Carl. That was a really interesting uh, contribution. And thank you um, afterwards uh, for sending through the slides to me with the links, which will be really helpful. Um, Steve, G0NIF, you've got a question. You need to unmute, Steve. You're still on mute, Steve. That's it. Right, Steve, you put your hand up. You've got a question. We can't hear you. We've got no audio from you. You're unmuted, Steve, but no audio. If we can't solve it quickly, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you, Steve. It may be, I don't know if you've been using digital modes during the day. <laughs> your, your audio has been captured by uh, FT8. <laughs> Can we hear you now? No, still can't hear you. We'll leave you to fiddle with it and we'll, we'll go over to, um, I'll just drop the slides, Carl, and we'll, we'll um, go over to the, the, um, okay. the, the room. Okay, who's got a question uh, or contribution on Carl's contribution tonight? Who wants to go first? Russell here. Yeah, Russell, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks very much. It's a really interesting discussion there. Um, so you were showing some slides earlier that had uh, double peaks or rather overlaps. And I was wondering whether uh, any of the earlier cycles showed the split between the north and the south hemispheres of the sun in the way that the last what three or four do or is this something that we simply don't have the data for yeah good question russell uh looking back at all 24 solar cycles 
you know, it seems like 22, 23, and 24 are really the first time we saw it to this magnitude. So okay. something's going on. <laughs> we don't know what it is. As long yeah, as the sun aliens. doesn't go out. It's obviously aliens. Yeah. As long yeah. as the sun doesn't go out, we're okay, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go along with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. Uh, anyone else with a question or... or um issue they want to raise with Carl. I don't see you wave, just uh, just unmute yourself and go in. Trust you to behave. <laughs> Everyone's very quiet this evening. Mm -hmm. who's, who's got a question? You stunned everyone, Carl. <laughs> no, no, I think everybody's probably depressed because the uh, most of the predictions are for a small cycle. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wouldn't it be good to have a big one there? Yep. It would be nice. It would uh, really show the newcomers what can happen. <laughs> yep. Show me what could happen. Yeah. <laughs> so, I yeah have, uh... well, Gerald, got you. Need to unmute, Gerald? Is that better? I... That's it. Yeah. All right, good. Sorry about that. It's coming loud and clear through my end. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carl. That was really interesting. I've been taking avid notes at this end, actually, because I want to look back at it afterwards. But um, you mentioned about um, the uh, low power and so on. On the, on the rising cycle, you said it sounded we might get uh, some good propagation on 10 and maybe even six meters. And um, I'm particularly interested. Is it going to be anywhere like back in the 60s and the 70s which i think you remember as well because uh, he used to work mobile with 10 watts and uh worked all over the world on it from the car with it when it was going and traveling around mm -hmm. and um is there any chance of it being like that at all this year if it's a big if it's a big cycle there's a good chance but um uh right now it doesn't look like cycle 25 is rising fast enough to do anything big but mm. but we got to realize the sun will do what it wants to do not what we think it should do <laughs> so just keep watching keep your fingers crossed i'll do just okay. that thank you very much over to you okay Nick. thank you gerald uh, let's go to california fred hey uh thank you um i have a quick question for you um so all the propagation has to do with uh, the ionosphere. So does it mean if someday we are going to live on Mars, we won't be able to do HF? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, you know, Mars does, has an, does have an atmosphere. It's about one hundredth of the pressure on Earth, but it does have an atmosphere and it's mostly CO2. And that can be ionized. And we, uh, you know, our orbiters, our Mars orbiters, have been measuring the Mars ionosphere. And it looks like the Mars ionosphere kind of looks like our E region, because Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. That's mm, uh, nothing to speak of like ours. So, uh, and I've looked at some of the uh, data from Mars, and it looks like uh, at least 20 meters will be... Uh, a good band to be on uh, when you're on Mars. Uh, unfortunately, I think as the sun sets on Mars, the whole ionosphere is going to go away because there's no uh, <laughs> no f no there's no magnetic field that keeps electrons <laughs> trapped. So. It, it may be tough, only ground wave at night, but uh, some good e, uh, e skip during the day, it looks like. Carl, that, I think I, the, I don't, the, the biggest problem is that there's nobody there at the other end to work. It, probably right, yeah. Yeah, our first colonies will be in one spot, so we, yeah. we, we, we don't need much. <laughs> we could probably wave, right? <laughs> Two meters will be fine. But who knows what's going to happen in the far distant future. Uh, Maybe we'll figure out a way to get there quicker too. <laughs> okay, good question, Fred, and, and thanks, Carl. Right, yeah. anyone else with a question to Carl? Mm. 
You got your hand up, Terry. I could, if you're just pointing at the computer, no, you haven't. No. Okay. Right. Anyone else with questions, Carl? Everyone's very, very quiet indeed. <laughs> Carl, I, I know I've got a question for you, and that is um, having these two peaks during mm -hmm. a solar cycle seems to happen less frequently than the norm and why why is it thought that there can be two very very strongly defined peaks over the cycle um, because uh, we we've had a i mean certainly in my time in amateur radio we've had a couple of them um where there have been two very very quite pronounced peaks and then a drop in between the two of them yeah. Um, well, why do we think that happens? Well, I'm, I'm not sure we under, fully understand what causes that. Um, now, now you're getting into some of the things that some of the predictions look at. Uh, the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn, how much torque there is on the sun, and in fact, one of the predictions uses all that and suggests that the two hemispheres aren't going to work together. So one hemisphere is going to generate sunspots, and then it's going to go away, and the next one will generate sunspots later. And of course, that doesn't add up to a big cycle. Uh, in fact, that prediction says this is going to happen for cycle 25, 26, and 27. So that's even more uh, frustrating news if it happens. Well, it probably won't, won't matter to me. I'll make it through cycle 25. I'm 73, so uh, I'll make it through another cycle, but 26 is kind of iffy for me. <laughs> and I guess I won't care too much. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I guess we, we're all radio amateurs, aren't we? So, it's 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 about discovering what it's like, and you can look at predictions, and what yep. can be happening can look very different from what the predictions actually were. Yeah. And and I've I've got, I've got a comment for our our new amateurs in the call here tonight, um, who've recently got licenses, even in cycle twenty four which was not brilliant. And if cycle 25 is going to be similar, the peak of cycle 24, it was quite possible to work using 10 watts of FM and a ground plane antenna into the repeaters on the east coast of the states from Europe, from, yep. from England. So yep. just 10 watts and a vertical work through the repeaters on uh, FM repeaters on 10 meters. I was doing that seven years ago. Um, we'll be doing that again, won't we? Yes, we. I think it's, yeah, if cycle 25 is like 24, that's going to happen. We're going to have some great, like I mentioned, some great six meter propagation via the F2 region around solar maximum. It's going to be worldwide. And uh, yeah, we'll have a good time in, a, in several years. <laughs> Nick, I, I would add to that, that uh, even in a sunspot minimum, it's possible to, to go for it. So in, in four months between July and uh, November last year, I, uh, I got this, which is my DXCC certificate. Great, Russ. Um, yeah. Yeah, we also, have to, we also have to remember that the atmosphere changes throughout the year. And yep. uh, in the northern hemisphere, there's more ionization in the fall and winter months. Absolutely. That's kind of why CQ Worldwide and ARRL contests are when they are. And uh, uh, so, so as we progress through summer, things will get better regardless of the sunspots. <laughs> uh, Terry VFC. Yes, go ahead, Terry. Yeah, just the thought that uh, the Twin Peaks uh, not to be confused with a television program somewhere. Right. <laughs> um, I wonder if uh, if they're really one peak, but with a, a disturbance, a hole in between, you know, between the outer flanks. So it would have been higher, but uh, something got in the way. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Since we don't understand it, uh, you know, <laughs> who knows? Uh, did you know there's a name for that dip in the middle? It's called a, uh, some Russian name, Ganevishev uh, dip or something like that. So somebody named it even <laughs> for, for, what, for what that's worth. Uh, At least you Trevor, talk about looks it. Looks like Trevor has his hand up. Maybe. Yes, go ahead, Trevor. Oh, I guess he didn't. <laughs> There's that Ian. No, that's Trevor, I guess. Right. Yeah, anyone else with a question to Carl while we've got him? There, John does. Yeah, if I'm, if yeah I'm go right. ahead, John. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, Carl. Um, as a 17 year old, um, one year into the hobby, I've no doom and gloom at all. I think the conditions are absolutely marvelous because I don't know any difference. Yeah. See, um, everybody tells me how good it was and, oh, this is terrible. And they come on the air on, the, on our local nets and, oh, bands were dead. I think they're good because I don't know any different, do I? So yeah. I'm a bit more positive about this. And it's 7 yeah. seven. I, I probably won't see two of them sometimes. So it's pretty good. So just, just my point. When I was a novice, uh, I didn't know a darn thing about it. But man, I had so much fun on 40 meters. It was great. It didn't matter. <laughs> there were people to work and uh, everything was new and the whole world opened up. Could I just make a comment about... Go ahead, um, <clears throat> right, this may sound a peculiar question, but can we defy the law of physics and propagation? Right. Most of us run mo moderate or very low key stations, very relatively lowish power, several hundred watts. Some countries in Europe, around the world, can run much more than a kilowatt and, 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 and do with massive beams. I'm talking now about... Um, 12 element HF beams and we all know that it all depends it's a compromise between our station and propagation and we always talk about DX now uh, the bands can be flat the, the bands can be in poor condition uh, my question is, if it's a, or it's more of a sort of a, I'm asking you for your thoughts. If the bands are so flat and propagation is poor and we're at the sort of low end of the cycle, starting to climb up cycle 25, can we defy it with 11 element HF log periodics and running three kilowatts to work the DX? Well, there's, uh, I think there's a lower limit. <laughs> I mean, even, even, you know, the, the, the two big multi, uh, op, multi multis here in the States, K3LR and W3LPL, mm -hmm. you know, they have <clears throat> massive antenna farms, but uh, they are legal power though, 1500 mm -hmm. Watts over here. And, uh, uh, they, they even at solar men they can still work a lot of people and i think what that says is the bands are open a heck of a lot more than we think they are you know the higher bands and uh when people get on whoa there's a lot of people to work uh and and yeah so what you're saying is that on a Cycle high on a high cycle, it's basically simple on low power with a low quality, not a low quality, but very low, uh, not low, but uh, minimalistic antennas. Whereas in sunspot minimums, mm -hmm. a guy running two kilowatts with a lock periodic can still make it where others can't even hear them. Well, well, at solar minimum, uh, your geographic coverage shrinks. 
<laughs> basically at solar minimum, it's north south type stuff. So like here in the States, it's solar minimum, you know, W3LPL, K3LR work a lot of stations, but they're South American, Central America, Caribbean. Uh, it's tough. Uh, they don't work very well. Maybe the very Western Europe stuff, you know, CTs and uh, stuff like that. But uh, solar minimum also carries a geographic uh, uh, slimming down of uh, what what's capable of going uh, be working. Yeah. yeah, there there was a just final comment. I've heard that the nearer to the equator you are, the better you will get longer distance communication. And again, it's based on the ionization. Right. Can you can you make any comment on that? Yes, I mentioned in the presentation that uh, the equatorial ionosphere mm -hmm. is the most robust in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, even at solar minimum, there's trans-equatorial propagation. Uh, here in the States, we work into deep South America. Uh, in Europe, you work into South, Af South Africa, down in that area. And of course, the, the Japanese stations work into Australia. That's pretty much just a north-south path, mostly, yeah. across the magnetic equator. And... Unfortunately, if you're far enough north, you need a link to trans-equatorial propagation, which could be a sporadic E link, or it could be an F2 region link. Uh, the guys in the southern, in, in the Caribbean, they, they, they can work trans-equatorial propagation uh, pretty easily, even at solar minimum, you know, on 10 meters. And, and uh, of course, FT8 opens up even a new layer <laughs> for them. But up here in Indiana, we need some kind of link to get close enough to take advantage of trans-equatorial propagation. But uh, yeah, the, the, there's no doubt that uh, the closer you are to the equator, it helps. And it's pretty obvious for, for me up here in Indiana to hear the southern tier of the United States working stuff I can't even hear. And they're just closer to higher ionization. We, we, we say that it's a lot easier to work the DX if you're in the Mediterranean part of yes. Europe. Yes, yes. Southern Europe, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ken. Right, anyone else with a question to Carl? Um, just one from me, if you don't mind. Yes, please, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Hi, Carl. Uh, great oh. talk, really enjoyed it. Um, we do, uh, I, I live in Blackpool on, on the northwest coast of the United Kingdom, so next to the sea, basically. And um, regardless of the propagation numbers, etc., cetera, um, we can work some very up the X from here uh, down. And certainly, I find it quite easy to work down into um, the Caribbean, for example. Uh, and and we, we also, uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, work certainly plenty of areas down towards Australia and um, that's on voice propagate that's on voice only by the way not not using FP8 or anything else um, so although propagation numbers might be low um, the C seems to make just so much difference to that to that it doesn't you know we don't really we don't rely on the ionization as much as I mean yes it you know it can be poor don't get me wrong but in general terms we get a lot more out of it and the amount of times that me and my colleagues who do this are called liars and we're talking to ourselves and all sorts of things like this. But it seems to me that that makes a lot, a lot of difference, even regardless of the propagation numbers. Yeah, there's uh, other things that have to be considered be besides the ionosphere. If you're uh, you know, near the ocean on a cliff, uh, <laughs> uh, you probably have a good advantage. Uh, and one of the problems we have is understanding the short term variation of the ionosphere. We don't have a very good handle on that. We understand it in the longer term, but there's lots of interesting stuff going on up there in the atmosphere, ionosphere. And uh, if you're in the right place at the right time, <laughs> you can have a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, Ken, who asked this question earlier, is like you, a great uh, fan of uh, um, portable um, pedestrian mobile, as he calls it, uh, operating and gave a talk to the club a few months ago on, on the subject, that, which is dear to your heart, I know, Brian, up yeah. there in Blackpool. Um, Ken's operations... Oh, sorry, guys, have, I'm being a cheat. <laughs> yeah, Ken, Ken's operations have been down from uh, uh, Echo Alpha Land. Uh, oh, okay. and uh, near the Salt Lagoon, so we're definitely an improvement. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm a lot warmer than Blackpool mostly as well, Ken. <laughs> hey, Nick, have, have you heard anything yet on uh, about the RSGB convention? Uh, is it on or not? Uh, as far as I know, it's not going to be, okay. still not going to be a physical convention. Okay, um, okay. We, we're, we're in a position where it's it's possible on the the COVID roadmap, the government's opened up that by the middle of June, uh, larger events will be possible, but there is no certainty. So yeah. ev everyone who's planning these things, unless they've got multi-million pound backers behind them and huge insurances uh, yeah. aren't, aren't booking events because they're just worried about being left. So uh, yeah. I think I think we're in a position, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an active, uh, part of the GQRP club and we're we're in having discussions about the GQRP club convention in September which last year was all online uh, this okay. year we don't know whether we're going to be able to have a physical part of it or not if we can we'll do the two together we'll run it as an online and and a physical convention together but that's not till September and we still don't know whether that's going to be possible yeah, okay. I know Friedrich Schaffen just got cancelled too, right? They have indeed, yeah. 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 yeah so it could be that another year. <laughs> I, hopefully, I uh, another year. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think worldwide, Carl, I think I mean I there's lots of us here from other countries and other parts of Europe are behind the UK in vaccination. And I know parts of America are, are, are very far ahead. I see in New York they're now opening up vaccinations to the over 30s incredible um so um you know the, i i think we're still a long way away aren't we from from yeah. any certainties about uh about how the rest of this year is going to go yeah um, and we don't know we don't even know do we whether we're going to get another variant and that variant could just wipe everything out anyway no we yeah. we have we have no idea at all yeah Okay. Anyone? Anyone got any more questions to Carl before we uh, before we close the the meeting? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Last one. one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I can't. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. The um, my question is about uh, sporadic key. Uh, is there any correlation between uh, solar cycles and sporadic key uh, activity? From the data I've seen. There doesn't seem to be a core, a strong correlation. So I think you can expect a, a good sporadic E season in the summer, regardless of where we are. Uh, what's interesting is the where sporadic E occurs, and it looks like it's it's kind of shifted over the past several decades. Uh, that, that that is fascinating. And, and you know, you try and think of why that happens. Well, the, of course, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, you know, the, the poles are moving and uh, uh, the intensity is slightly going down. So <laughs> a lot of interesting stuff. You've got, uh, you know, Jim, G3, uh, is it y YLA, Jim Bacon? He's a meteorologist and uh, he's very much into trying to understand sporadic E. Yeah, a lot of people is trying to, to understand sporadic key, but uh, it, it, it's always uh, a mystery. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think, uh, yeah. like, like, I think we had a very good sporadic key season last summer, which... Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Solar but <laughs> but yeah. I, I think that um, uh, we see increased sporadic key activity also because uh, we have much more FT8 activity. Yes. Uh, so we are able to, to catch those, uh, sporadic key, also even very short spots of sporadic key. Uh, okay. And this is a kind of thing that until a few years ago, we were not able to, to, 
to, uh, yeah. to spot them. Yeah, FT8 has opened up just a whole new layer of working people. Absolutely. <laughs> and if conditions aren't very good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Carla. You're welcome. Thank you, Sandro. Okay, uh, last call. Any any further questions or comments to Carl before we finish? No, if not, uh, can we show our appreciation to Carl's contribution tonight in the normal way? And thank you very much indeed for a very, very good, uh, very, very good. Well, thank you, everybody. And, uh, I'm looking forward to maybe uh, seeing some of you at uh, RSGB in 2022, hopefully. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe you know, at a Dayton in 2022. You never know. Yeah, we, we St Steve Nichol um, uh, came along to one of our club talks mm -hmm. uh, last year on uh, talking to us about HF propagation. Uh, so yeah, we 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 know Steve very well, and um, good. Uh, I'm, yeah, good a good uh, good uh, link to his book as well. Uh, yes. Various people have have joined us tonight from some other radio clubs in the UK, from Newbury and from Hull, and uh, we got comments on the chat from both of them saying. Uh, thank you for a great contribution, Carl. So um, you're uh, welcome. Thank, thank you again. I'm, I mean, I would just say in, in closing before we uh, kind of close the uh, the formal part of the meeting, uh, and I think you said it yourself, Carl. Um, a band can appear to be dead, but a CQ call may well produce something that you didn't expect. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I I had that the other night. I was calling on forty meters for quite a long time on CW didn't get any reply suddenly a station comes back and they were in Uruguay coming through very very solid S7 yep. Um, yep. I was completely surprised because I couldn't hear anything and no one had called and I think you know one of the things we discover I mean WPX if if you were on the bands two days before the WPX contest you would have thought HF conditions were terrible and nothing was happening mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. with uh, with hundreds of thousands of radio amateurs active over the weekend suddenly the bands are absolutely jammed um, mm. and and buzzing with stations and we've got some new licensees in our club andrew uh, 2e0gyi who made the point that you know suddenly you've got all these countries in his logbook that he he never yep. expected to get yep. working 50 watts with a very very simple antenna so thank you very much, Carl. Okay. I'm going to end, end the recording and uh, and thank 